When removing the parts, it's best to use a sharp pair of pliers. These can be one of the hobby craft ones, or they can be just from the local hardware store. When removing the parts, cut about three to four millimeters above the part, and then once the part has been removed from the sprue, cut it again, but still leaving a little bit of a stub of about one millimeter or so. This is to avoid damaging the part, as if you cut too close straight away, the stress in the plastic and the plastic sprue can actually cause damage to the part, which can be easily cleaned up afterwards, but it's additional work. So to remove the little stub, get a sharp blade, preferably a new one, and start chipping away at the little stub. Do it from both ends, don't just do it from the one side. Again, this is to avoid a little bit of damage because sometimes what can happen is that last little bit can actually tear off rather than have a clean cut. Whereas if you do it from both sides, you avoid that as well as improving your chances to get a nice straight and flush. Remember that there are stubs not just from the leading edge, but also from the underside. This means that when you're actually gluing the two parts together, there may be a little bit of excess plastic still left, which will cause a little bump. When gluing multiple small parts together, sometimes it can be more effective to assemble the pieces together first and then to apply the glue. This should really only be used on internal parts as by using the capillary action of the glue, you will get excess glue around the edges. And if any of the parts are on the outside, obviously you're gonna have excess glue that will need to be cleaned up and sanded back. When gluing complex multiple parts that require mutual support in order for them to remain in place where they're supposed to go, it is important that you glue all of these pieces at the same time. If you were to glue one piece and let it set, it may not be in the correct place. And sometimes a little bit of jiggling is required to make sure that they fit properly. So again, assemble the whole component as one and then let it set. When gluing large structural items, it is important that you ensure that the bond is strong. Here you can see one half of a MiG-29 wing, which will then be mated to the second half. If the join is not solid, you run the risk of either the part coming right off later on once the model is finished, or potentially leaving gaps and cracks that, that may occur. In any event, it's better to make sure that there's a solid join. As with the structural joins, when you're gluing large sub-assemblies together, you really need to make sure that there's adequate amount of glue coverage in between the two surfaces that are to be mated. You can use either the standard brush applicator or you can use a needle applicator as seen here. But give it two to three coats and then when you actually join the two parts together, add some additional glue in between the join and then make sure that it's nicely clamped and held in place until it sets. Usually about 10 minutes to half an hour. When gluing very large parts, such as 30 second scale jets, the two fuselage halves, often it's difficult to actually do it all in one hit. So one way to do it is to do it in sections. So the front section and then the rear section and invariably you will need to use clamps because there are so many different elements that don't always want to stay together. So by clamping it, you will ensure that the parts will set properly and with no gaps in between. Some kits are engineered to include screws and other elements that will help keep the parts together. However, this usually only works for the central part and the edges, such as the front fuselage here, will still need to be glued properly and clamped down. When clamping curved surfaces, such as a fuselage, one method is to use cable ties. This is usually far more effective than traditional clamps 
mainly because traditional clamps may, may struggle to grip the curved surface and actually stay and maintain that grip. So often, the best way is to use the cable tie, as you can see here. Sometimes when mating fuselage parts with the wing roots, it may be difficult to do so due to the tight fit and glue it at the same time. Therefore, sometimes it's actually easier to fit the pieces together, not fully, just with a slight gap, a few millimeters, so it's actually slightly raised, and then apply the glue between the two parts. Often you can use the capillary action without touching the, the exterior surface. You can actually touch just the tip of the, the surface that actually will require the glue. And then once you clamp it all, then you can add a bit more glue in between the gaps to make sure that there's a strong bond. This may actually be the way to go when you're using resin cockpits that sometimes make the fuselage swell a little bit. So this is the, an easier method, especially if the fit is very tight, to actually get the fit in, make sure that it actually the, the parts fit, and then apply the glue. The downside is that you will probably get a little bit of excess glue on the fuselage. When gluing the traditional two fuselage halves, such as that of World War II aircraft, I find that one of the best methods of applying the glue is actually using a needle applicator. The way that this works is the glue just runs at a constant pace down the needle, which means that you need to keep the needle moving across the surface, but you will get a constant stream of glue. The downside, of course, is that you get a constant flow of glue. So therefore, if you stop or if you want to adjust something or if you just slow down, the glue still keeps going at the same rate, which can then have a buildup in certain spots. So keep a steady hand, keep it moving. When the two fuselage halves are joined, you can then run the needle along the outside edge just to make sure that there's sufficient glue within the joint. And as before, the best way to clamp the two fuselage halves together is to use cable ties. Often I'll do the rear section first, clamp it down, and then clamp down the front part. This may not always be possible in every scale, but where practicable, it's probably the best way to do it, just to break it up a little bit. That way the glue doesn't dry prematurely. Sometimes you will be required to glue metal components to plastic parts. This can be in the form of attachment points, such as this flap, which will then attach to the wing by only the two metal stubs. The way to do it is to actually use two different glue types. So you will need to use CA glue or super glue to actually glue the metal part to the plastic. But then of course, you will need to use traditional plastic cement to glue the plastic parts together. Sometimes the fit is not ideal and you will have a little bit of a bulging part. However, luckily this will not be seen in the current setup and it's important to make sure that it's solidly clamped together when it dries. Sometimes the fit is such that the plastic just does not want to fit properly into the shape that it's supposed to go and it will require clamping in order for it to dry and set and it will actually bend the plastic slightly. So you can see here with these air intakes, I had to force the plastic out of shape through the use of glue. Occasionally you will get panels that will just plop onto the fuselage and in this scenario, you really only need to apply glue to one surface. With some model kits, the rear fins can be a little bit problematic in that they don't always fit flush 
with the fuselage and the, the actual join is not very solid and there's, there's usually a bit of a gap. What can make it worse is that it can have a bit of a wobble to it, as you can see here. It's not firmly in place at the set angle. So when you add and finalize the, the glue, make sure that when it actually starts to dry and set, that it sets at the right angle. This is very important. You've got to make sure that the alignment is correct. Once it's all glued and dried, you can see that, that there's a big gap here. This will be problematic in future because it can actually rip off if you're not careful. So what I would highly recommend is that you fill in the gap as much as possible with CA glue. Afterwards, you can trim it, so remove any excess glue. The CA glue can be sanded back to actually provide the gap filling purpose. However, I find that it's not ideal and I do prefer to then apply additional coats of putty If you're building a traditional World War II plane that sits on its tail, and it does, that's fantastic. But when you're building a jet with a front nose wheel and it sits on its tail, it's a disaster. So often you will need to use various different lead weights. I normally just get fishing weights, just found in your local fishing store, and fill up the, the front area of the nose. That's usually the best place. Sometimes you may need to do it above the the front undercarriage, other times under the, the actual cockpit, but wherever you can find space at the front of the aircraft, that's where you want to apply the weight. In smaller scales, sometimes one weight is enough. Sometimes the weight might actually be a little bit too big or might protrude a little bit out the front. So you might need to look at trimming it. So make sure that you do lots of test fitting and dry fitting before you glue anything down because it's much easier to adjust and to modify the weight or the size of the weight when you can remove it from the plane before you actually glue it in. One way to test whether you've got sufficient weight in the nose is to hold the aircraft roughly where the wheel legs will be, hold it with just a few fingers and then balance it to see if it will tip forward or backward. In other words, to find the center of gravity. But to be safe, always add a little bit more just to make sure. Often there are items in the instructions that don't actually need to be built. Sometimes this can be an engine, sometimes it's a gun bay with ammunition, things like that, that unless you're actually opening it up, so you can just skip them altogether. You still need to build some of the components just for structural strength, but not everything. Many of the recent kits from the last, say, 15 years or so have got some very interesting engineering solutions that really allow you to either get very good results just in terms of build quality, but also sometimes they can actually get you very good results in terms of the angles of the way things fit. For instance, always getting the dihedral alignment with some of the wings has generally been in over the years where the modeler need to adjust and accurately align everything themselves. Whereas with a lot of the new kits, it's done for you because it only fits one way and pieces interlock. If you're more interested in actually just enjoying the bit and having it all really fit nicely, do some research online and almost all of the kits have actually been examined and built by other modelers, whether it's on blogs or on websites. So just, just Google it, explore some of the kits that you might be interested in or subjects and just see what kits and how old they are, how well they fit. And sometimes brand can also play a part in this. And sometimes there's always those parts that don't have any alignment guides themselves. So you just have to really line it up yourself and ensure that through feel and through looking at it from different angles that it lines up. As part of the build sequence, I often actually 
putty up and rescribe and re rivet certain sections of the aircraft as they get built, just to help with handling. When attaching the wings, extra care should be taken to make sure that the angle is correct, but also that it's got a solid joint because sometimes the way that models can be handled is one hand on the fuselage and one hand on, on a wing. On kits where the wings have to be manually attached to either the fuselage or wing stubs, as you can see here, often there, there is no better clamping system than your hands. It's just an unfortunate fact, but it's worthwhile spending those few minutes holding it in place to get a really good result. That's all for this episode of Scale Model Cinema. I hope you enjoyed it and will join us again in the future. Check out other videos at scalemodelcinema.com or like us on Facebook. Cheers.